Okay, excellent. Well, thank everybody. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, this has been an exciting day. I've just really enjoyed myself. And um, this session is going to be run by Dr. Jody Jensen, who is still relatively new in our department, has been with us for a couple of years now. She's an assistant professor in English, um, specializing in world literature. And her research especially focuses on post-colonial literature and theories and pedagogy um, and diasporic literature, as well as global film and visual media. And today her session is titled Murder, Madness and Feral Children. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jody. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk with us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Moser. I uh, wanna start out just by saying it's, it's felt really good, particularly with the past few years, not being able to go to many conferences. Um, this has been a great opportunity for me to feel like we're all learning together and we get to have a common conversation. So I'm, I'm super um, appreciative that this exists. And also because this is absolutely an important topic, um, I think for all of us to be considering and talking about, um, and it's certainly one that's very important to me. So I'm, I'm very, I'm feeling very grateful to be here today. I couldn't help myself because teachers, you know, I know we have to have, PowerPoints, I think, but um, hopefully, did the, the entirety of the PowerPoint pop up for all of you? Okay. So today's discussion for me, um, I really hope that it's more an informal chat because I think that that's what decolonial pedagogy in particular is about, is actually talking with one another and hashing out ideas. And I also wanna recognize that uh, the discussion today is very much based on a, a specific point of view from um, academia and a, a teaching perspective. So as we go, please feel free to stop me if you have comments or questions. Um, part of what I hope happens today is also I have certain questions that I'm hoping we can engage with as we move along. Um, one of my favorite theorists um, who recently passed away is Bell Hooks. And I think that as I was thinking about the discussion for today, there are two things. One, because I am relatively new, I wasn't sure what the format should look like. So I wanna apologize in advance for some of the things that may seem um, like very obvious information, but I also didn't wanna presuppose a sense of knowledge in areas that perhaps we're not all familiar with. Um, and the reason that I have Bell Hooks in the beginning here is because as an educator, this is a very important concept for me because when we talk about decolonial, anything. We're actually talking about lived experiences. And this is something that um, for me has to be connected to the classroom and to scholarship. So one of my favorite pieces from her is the one you see here. All of us in the academy and in the culture as a whole are called to renew our minds if we are to transform educational institutions and society so that the way we live, teach, and work can reflect our joy in cultural diversity our passion for justice and our love of freedom. And I like to start with this, um, particularly, I gotta tell you, I wasn't anticipating it, but Dr. Nkonkwo's plenary had so many links um, that maybe this discussion is probably superfluous now, but uh, the idea that the culture wars are back. The discussion that he had about this notion of the whole story, um, Adiche's TED Talk, for those of you who have seen the whole thing, is absolutely exquisite. She goes on to tell us, connected to the title of the whole story, um, and I don't know all the background of um, you know, the, the concepts and theoretical underpinnings of this event, but the first thing I thought about was her talk when I saw it, because of course part of what she tells us is that the single story produces a stereotype, and the problem, this is sort of verbatim. The problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. And I think the notion of the whole story is one that's really important. So one of the questions that I'd like us to keep in mind and perhaps come back to, particularly near the end of our discussion, is what does the whole story mean to you? And I know from some of the previous um, breakout sessions, and questions that some of you are also teachers outside of higher education 
And, and so I think that this is a unique question for all of us to consider. Um, one of the things that I thought it might be important to do um, is simply take a look at a definition. Um, this is something that, oh man, I would say it took me quite a while to be like, yes, but what does this word mean? It's such a, it's such a big word. Um, and so the University of William and Mary has a decolonizing human, humanities project. And I took this directly from them because I feel like it's a very accessible definition and um, it, it is also very dynamic. So um, it's a group of, of scholars there and in defining decolonization, they state plainly said, decoloniality is a way for us to relearn the knowledge that has been pushed aside, forgotten, buried or discredited by the forces of modernity. Settler, colonial, settler colonialism and racial capitalism. Yeah, sorry, there we go. Uh, decoloniality is then a way to explore colonization, settler, settler colonialism, racial capitalism, particularly as it grew out in full racializing force with the enslavement of Black Africans, modernity, and most recently neoliberalism and necro capitalism and the ways in which they have displaced an array of modes of living, thinking, and being in our natural world. Um, pausing briefly here, there's obviously some uh, questions that we could raise about the language that they're using here, but as they keep going, they remind us that decoloniality reveals, quote unquote, the dark side of modernity and how it is built on the backs of others, others that modernity racializes, erases, and or objectifies. Therefore, decoloniality is not a singular thing. It is a method and paradigm of restoration and reparation that depends on context, historical conditions, and geography. Therefore, as a method, it aspires to restore, elevate, renew, rediscover, and acknowledge and validate, validate the multiplicity of lives, life experiences, culture and knowledge of indigenous people, people of color and colonized people, as well as to decenter heterosis normativity, gender hierarchies and racial privilege. Um, a lot of really big words, but one of the things that I really appreciate about this definition is that it reminds us it's not just a conversation about race um, and that there are specificities, specificities of geography that really help us to navigate these conversations. So this for me is a good starting place, particularly because we're coming from a lot of different um, directions and worldviews. So as Dr. Mazur mentioned, I do a lot of uh, world literature. Particularly, I focus my research on South Africa and India, and that's a slightly different approach. Um, but I did start out my studies looking at African American literature and theory. So I can see the overlaps between a lot of these conversations and they're really productive spaces. And race, however, as part of this construction or definition is usually a go-to spot versus gender because it's so visible and it's so obvious. And so as a thread of the conversation, that's the one that I wanna to try to follow today. On the left-hand side of the screen, there's a discussion from the Bridges Project in Higher Education. And this again is a collective group of scholars um, who are really interested in decolonization um, and particular as it, particularly as it relates to racism, which I hope will tie in as we keep going. And they state today there is a naive idea that racism is mostly a matter of moral behavior, of individual attitudes that refuse to accept diversity. This is dangerous in that it makes invisible a fundamental dimension of racism and decolonization, and one that directly affects the people considered quote unquote others, their lives and their possibilities. Racism is structural in European societies. Um, and I would argue here, that's not unique to European societies, um, but since that's their placement, that's where they're speaking from. Um, it is not just an individual inclination. 
as Garcias and Amazin state uh, or points out, racism is a modern pattern of Western power. This fundamental product is the nation state, sustained and reproduced through institutional regulations and practices, not only at the level of social interactions between individuals. So this is the, the idea that um, I will often say when having conversations like these, that let's play the believing game. And let's assume that the claims made by the Bridges Project are true and that racism is a system of practices, it's systemic. Um, we would be hard pressed, I think, to find a lot of people who probably wouldn't nod their head along to this. And the question for us then is how do the histories of colonization and decolonization, specifically as they relate or related or are related to constructions of race, inform the patterns and structures we live in? And we've already started part of this discussion earlier today when Dr. Conquo was, was talking, right? Um, and so, oh, make sure I can actually move, there we go. Um, so we're gonna go back a little bit in, in time here to take a look at some of the historical background that informs the system, the system that we navigate in terms of the construction of race that impacts some of the decolonial efforts that we're talking about and witnessing and working on in our own work. So Samuel George Morton, um, and some of you may be familiar with this particular scientist, um, came up with this pattern or hierarchy. Okay? So this was the science of the time. You can see his, his date of birth and death. Um, 1799 to 1851. So this is bridging into the height of imperial behavior, particularly for the British Empire, kind of a golden age. Morton believed in the theory of separate creations, not particularly surprising given his moment in history, but he decided to study craniology. And in doing so, he categorized skulls. And we can see here for example, um, up in the top left portion of the corner, that he would take the skulls and say, this one is prettier. This one is more beautiful. It is more evolved. Worked out really well if you were part of the Caucasian group that he was taking a look at. Not so great if we go down to the latter half of this slide and scientifically for his time, though he obviously has been proven wrong, um, we get the comparison of black skulls to that of monkeys. So they are less evolved, they are animalistic. And we start to get a discussion that's not necessarily just based on individual point of view or lack of access to difference, but here it's becoming part of the science of the time. We can see then on the far side of the screen how this evolves um, in this particular time period. Now, part of starting with this, um, you know, whenever I'm presenting this information, particularly to students, they will tell me, yeah, yeah, but we're better now. We're better now, right? We don't do that. We don't believe these things. But what's fascinating, and this gives the title um, for the discussion today, which is mur murder, madness, and feral children. One, I wanted you to come to the session, so I was trying to make it an uh, interesting kind of topic. But the other is that these ideas that Morton laid out became part of the historical fabric. And they just, these ideas disseminate, and we get them repeated, particularly in literature. Um, but as we'll see, also just in social structures. So the images here, one of them is from Heart of Darkness, Joseph Conrad. Um, we get concepts of, of madness. For those of you who have read this text, um, we get the descent into the native, right? Going native, we get this phrase. We also get the repetition and it continues. This is a, an image in the background there from a more recent depiction of Kipling's Jungle Book, right? Um, we get feral children as part of this, this animalistic representation of various people groups across the globe. And so the concept here is that these colonial discourses 
Um, and this is a direct quote from Paul Gilroy, a post-colonial scholar, who tells us these colonial discourses continue to inform contemporary attitudes to race and ethnicity and religion, gender, and class in the post-colonial era. Um, it's debatable perhaps if we're occupying that or not, but I think that is besides the point in terms of this discussion. So one of the things that I find super interesting, and I wish I could take credit for finding all of these, but the truth is, is that I'm buried in my books and I'm not often looking for them. Okay? But thankfully, students are paying attention and they send me a lot of this stuff. Um, in 2017, a Chinese museum was forced to yank a racist exhibit. And we'll see that there's obviously direct connection to those ideologies put out uh, by George Morton. And then, of course, we get that stronghold that it just continues. So um, the excerpt that you see here on the screen was actually taken from um, the New York Post. And I was able to get a screenshot, though it's a bit blurry, of the, uh, some of the exhibit photographs before they were yanked, um, not just from the exhibit, but taken offline. The discussion in the New York Post tells us that a Chinese museum was forced to yank an exhibit comparing Africans to animals. Dozens of the photos were removed from the showcase, which was entitled, quote, this, was, this is Africa, end quote. The photographer behind the exhibit, Yu Haiping, claimed the photos offer a peek at, quote unquote, primitive life in Africa by juxtaposing humans with nature, according to Shanghaiists. He has visited Africa more than 20 times over the past decade. And I like the, the link there with visiting, somehow knowing something. Um, but before viewers complained about the photos, the president of the prestigious China Photographic Publishing House praised the photographer for, quote unquote, capturing the vitality of primitive life in a since deleted social media post, according to the Washington Post. What's fascinating about these is we like to at many times, um, particularly in the classroom, for people to say that um, we are uh, colorblind, which is of course problematic to begin with in terms of discussing race, but also to add that, no, 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 we don't do that anymore. And this is a very good example of where we see those initial discussions, that structure, the system bleeding into future conversations, right? Perhaps with us, not really paying attention to it. Um, I wish it stopped there, but it doesn't. So H&M in 2017 got a lot of backlash for this one. And this particular advertisement and campaign had a young um, African-American child wearing a hoodie with the, uh, the language coolest monkey in the jungle. This is contrasted, of course, to the Caucasian child next to him, um, whose sweatshirt reads Mangrove Jungle, official survival expert, junior tour guide. Um, have any of you seen this before? This one? Okay, yeah. It was particularly um, offensive because of course there is almost a direct line. I mean, you could not see a direct line between some of those ideologies that Morton had come up with such a long time ago to 2017, right? I mean, it's a student actually brought this one to me because I am not very fashion conscious, so I was not paying attention. And um, I actually didn't, I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know how to respond. So I said, I have no words, but let me think on this and we'll talk about it in class, which we did. 2019, we get a variation of this. Um, during Black History Month, we, we witnessed one of the world's biggest luxury brands launch an $890 blackface sweater. After getting blasted on Twitter and being forced to remove its deeply offensive sweater from stores, Gucci then made the jaw-dropping statement that it didn't know blackface images were racist. In all of these, I'm thinking to myself, both as a consumer and someone concerned with the discussions that we've been having today, how many levels of people these things had to go through 
It wasn't one person. This is a hierarchy of people who said, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Right. Um, and of course, on the side there, we get one of those images again with the black face. This is a more traditional um, image of it. For those of us who love breakfast at Tiffany's, we also get a variation of this um, with um, Holly Golightly's neighbor, whose name I'm forgetting. Yep, it's gone. Okay, but we get someone represented as Asian who is not in that particular film. Mickey Rooney, I think, wasn't it? We're not sure. Anyway. And um, to preface this particular discussion here, I love this movie. So I, I feel a little bit bad digging into it, but I do think that it brings up some really interesting ideas for us. Um, Black Panther is one of those films that was lauded for the way that it reproduced or produced images of African life as powerful, right? Women were powerful. We get these amazing images that have a lot of uh, movement behind them. But on the other side, we get a variation of some of those ideologies that we see in Morton. We actually get a discussion here about exoticism. And traditionally, when we use this term now, we use it rather casually. So exotic fruits, exotic hobbies, exotic dancers. However, exoticism is absolutely a complex philosophical, historical, and representational issue. It's concerned with the way we perceive and describe difference or others. And it's particularly problematic um, when we see, for example, on the bottom of the screen, how certain uh, groupings of people, different groupings of people are represented visually in the film. So I want to pause here a little bit because I've thrown a lot of information your way um, to, to focus a second our conversation on this bottom question on the screen. So the larger question I think for us in these ideas or thought processes is to ponder what forms of exoticism or going back to Morton, I think we can lump that in, right? So some of these systemic ideologies that have kind of a drip down quality. Uh, do you guys see in your everyday lives or in society? I'm trying to find the, uh, the right screen view so I can see if y'all or anyone has their hands up or wants to speak to that. So I know, for example, from my point of view as an educator, that one of the ways that I see these conversations dripping in specifically to higher education um, our racialized versions of our athletes, of our student athletes. Um, we see some of that discussion and it's problematic, particularly when we think of them as the student athlete, um, those constructions of, of race. Are there other areas that all of you feel like you experience this or see it? All right, well, I'll let you ponder it. Um, one of the, the reasons that I bring this up, of course, in a decolonial context is because academic institutions remain the main sites through which Western colonial power imposes a dominant type of knowledge or a way of knowing. Um, and it's necessary to analyze how the categories of difference are a result of colonial relations. Right? This is something that reaches far back, which is what makes it such a complex, excuse me, complex discussion. Um, and there are colonial relations of power, right? A smokescreen by which 
white supremacist institutions perpetuate visible and invisible racial hierarchies. One of the, the key points here, and this is also from the Bridges Project, is that in some discussions of decolonization and decolonial work in higher education, we perpetuate a victim method, right? A particular view of approaching race and racism that categorizes us as educators, as students, um, as administrators, these kinds of things um, into categories. And it's still the power or the powerless. Um, it's still the white or non-white, right? These are binaries that become very problematic for us and they should become problematic for us. So I've got another question. I'm gonna figure out here real quick how to be able to see, which I have not done before, the chat feature while I'm on here. But um, my assumption today was that the majority of us are part of higher education or education at large. And as students, scholars, perhaps administrators, my question that I'd like us to think about for a little bit today is, do you see the space that you occupy as a site through which, this is a direct quote, Western colonial power imposes a dominant type of knowledge or a way of knowing. This could be something enacted in your classroom, something you see in your institute as a whole, et cetera. And if so, I'm curious to know what ways of knowing you see emphasized. Hey, Jody. Yes. Are, are you asking if like we see kind of the difference of the this uh, colonial kind of uh, Western colonial institutions, like if, if we see that predominantly in, in our workspaces? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I've noticed, um, for example, is that students who come from either racial or ethnic backgrounds um, that are not well represented in higher education. Um, these are also students, for example, who use text to, um, or what is it, speech to text, excuse me, speech to text to write papers, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that of course happens in higher education, and this is part of um, that domination model, is that we work through, through actual written language, right? So it devalues, traditions that focus on orality as part of their knowledge making or storytelling. It doesn't have to be something like that, but just ways that you might see this um, in your work lives. Um, I think for me, I'm a high school English teacher. And something that I feel like I see a lot or talk about a lot with my colleagues is CRT. Um, and just being, have it, it's hard to know, okay, at what point are we going to cross the line that is going to bother people um, just by talking about race and racial issues. Um, I know we had parents calling at the very beginning of the school year, are you teaching critical race theory? They don't know what critical race theory is, but they're still concerned that it's being taught to their children. Um, and it's become such a big thing that, I mean, so I have social, I know of social studies teachers who get, especially those without tenure, who get nervous about bringing up these, these things that, um, as Dr. Conquo, uh, the quote that he mentioned um, from the woke act or whatever, that like makes kids uncomfortable and kind of makes them experience and struggle with that, like the knowledge of what ancestors had done. Um, so I see it in just like, even in myself, um, being concerned about, okay, I want to bring up these issues. They're important to talk about. We have black students and I want to, I want to honor and talk about that. Um, but there is such a stigma. It seems like at the, at the moment of talking about these issues, um, and of, you know, making the kids woke or whatever that means. Mm -hmm. 
Um, just from my former experience as, as an educator, um, I was teaching secondary English, edu- edu- uh, secondary English um, for sophomores. And I was the only um, person of color in my department, um, everyone else being uh, Caucasian. And I actually was the, was singled out by parents um, for having diverse books in my classroom. And I was the only one who was targeted by groups of parents and was then, you know, was brought up to the superintendent for having books on race um, and LGBTQ and immigrant issues. Um, And it was very strange because everyone else in my department had the very similar books, but I was the only one who was targeted. And I wasn't sure if this was like, oh, is it because I am a Latina educator or, or yeah, it, it just made no sense. And so, yeah, it becomes difficult to be the person who's like, I, I feel like I can talk about some of these issues, but also then not have that space to talk about it because of my background as well. So Um, I apologize because I had to step out earlier to check on the other session. I'm the only um, moderator at the moment, but I have a colleague actually at the college level, and I I don't know if this is exactly what you guys are talking about, but she interviewed for a position as what we were calling at the time an Anglo-Saxonist, and um, she is a woman of color, and the committee doing the interview told her how can we explain that you're our Anglo-Saxonist in the middle of the interview? Um, And so that's kind of what sparked, you know, a lot of of us in the field thinking about these questions and and how they're being represented and and dealt with, at least at the higher ed. Um, Dr. Mauser, going off of what you said, I had um, I had an experience where, um, well, several experiences where people just assumed that I was a Spanish te- Spanish teacher, and then I would have to say, oh, I actually teach English, and it was very uncomfortable <laughs> for them, I assume, um, as it was for me during that time. So. Thank you, thank you all for sharing these things. These are, these are super important. And I started the discussion today with Bell Hooks and one of my favorites, um, eye-opening moments in my own education was reading her quote. I think it's, I should get a tattoo or something. Uh, but she, she says, experience does not make you an expert. And if we were to switch some of this language and we weren't focusing on race, we can see how it becomes um, perhaps even more layered in really productive ways. For example, um, with my students, I will often use the discussion saying, you know, in terms of gender, right? I I identify as a woman, but I do not represent all women, nor do I have any desire to do so because my experiences do not align with the person sitting next to me or the person across the room, right? Um, And so particularly when I'm thinking about issues of this decolonial pedagogy, Right? How, as educators and as people interested in education, both in terms of society as well as an institution or at an educational level for students, how important it is for us to think about these things and to process what our role is. And it's, it's a very, very deep question. And I think this idea of you know, what ways of knowing do you see emphasized? Right? So, Cynthia, you had mentioned um, having diverse books. Um, I was teaching a course and decided, I think we're going to read all Black texts. And of course, students had things to say. They had things to say. Um, So we read only Black authors this semester. And of course, in my mind, I was thinking, huh, what's your point? Right. I spent, for example, my entire K through 12 education reading all white authors. 
um, very few, if any, that I can remember who were not part of that particular knowledge base. And so that was the way of knowing that was emphasized, right? Um, and is it, is it Nadiana? Did I say your name correctly? Okay. Um, right, this idea of not knowing when to cross the line, because, I mean, we know, right, borders are meant to be crossed, right? They're not just drawn in the sand, so to speak. Um, and crossing the line is, of course, a, a great challenge for all of us. And I imagine, Nadiana, especially for you, right? And Cynthia, are you also in K through 12? Um, I was a former teacher. Okay. I, I'm in higher ed now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, that these are difficult situations to bridge because we know intrinsically how important they are, right? Dr. Conquo's discussion earlier today, this idea of anything dead coming back to life hurts, right? Direct quote from Toni Morrison um, and his discussion about painting angels and saints or devils, right? He's got the religious context for that, but that also applies to us in terms of the notion of the colonized and the colonizer, right? And if we look at those power structures as they exist in education, it becomes um, even more difficult because now we have a false binary of language, us or them, right? Um, which of course is misconstructed. So thank you. Thank you for sharing these things, right? I think that part of sharing them also helps us all as educators, right? To figure out what our role is in that space and also to identify allies for sure. Um, relatedly, kind of to wrap up my discussion and then we'll see here how much time we have left. I think probably about five minutes by the time I stop talking so much. Um, Audre Lorde, also one of those theorists who I consider, um, I obviously don't know these ladies, but I consider them to be great mentors in my own education. That part of what I hope happens today, and I felt it earlier with Dr. Conquo's discussion, um, his passion for what he does and the reasons that he does it, right, has very little to do with literature and it has a lot to do with the reasons behind it. Um, and we see that in Audre Lorde's quote here. The true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations that we seek to escape but that piece of the oppressor, which is planted deep within each of us. Um, and at least for me as an educator, this is perhaps one of the most challenging um, things to keep in mind, right? In planning classes, in choosing texts, in figuring out, um, you know, what do I do with Othello? How do I present these discussions to students, right? Because they're so important. So I want to leave us with Audre Lorde because anything that I could say in comparison is not going to be useful, I don't think. Um, and I just want to end by thanking um, those who helped put together this discussion. So um, Dr. Megan Bever, Dr. Rebecca Mauser, and of course to um, Dr. Conquo for his discussion earlier, and then obviously the one that um, will follow this. And on an ending note, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see everybody again a little bit. There we go. Uh, are there any other thoughts or questions or things that you guys would like to bring up in relation to anything that we've talked about? Jody, I had, um, I was thinking about the exoticism in our society. So I thought about uh, in hip hop culture, actually, um, and we see this a lot with the, the Kardashians. They have this kind of ambiguous look of not knowing what their racial background is anymore. And just because of, you know, this, this, this whole stealing of culture, I, I would say. Um, so that, that was one example that I, that I had on that. Yeah, well, and I was thinking earlier, um, I admitted I planned the discussion really quickly this morning. Um, <laughs> we just started our semester, so I'm sure you can all empathize. Uh, but um, I was thinking about the Dove commercial 
that was quickly pulled. If you remember that, it, it's got the, uh, I think it was supposed to be progressive in its message, but essentially it was repeating those old colonial discussions where you used to have advertisements that says, buy this soap, it'll make you whiter for lack of better language. Um, and they repeated it with a backdrop that said before and after. And the after was the most pale of the women represented in that particular advertisement. So I think there is a lot of that that still exists that's very troubling that perhaps even advertisers, I mean, I don't know if Dove thought about that, to be honest. Um, you know, if we look at the Chinese exhibit, I don't know, maybe people weren't aware. Maybe they were right? It uh, doesn't make it okay either way, I don't think. But I think there is a lot of that kind of erasure still happening. Yeah, and that's that's almost what I'm struggling with with Othello is because we just read Act One. And so, of course, I go through and I point out as they're talking about Othello all the times, like, look, listen to them, compare him to a horse, like to an African horse, to a rant, like all of these things that make him animalistic. And I really, like, I struggled there because I was like, I really could cross that line and I really could say, and then here are some examples of like, this is still happening. And like, I have a, a black and Mexican student who like was told that uh, she, because she wears braids, she's going native or something um, by another student. Um, and just like, these things are still happening um, and they still happen here in the building and this is blah, 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 blah. Um, but then, well, first of all, I didn't have enough time to like, you know, have that whole discussion, but just this idea of like, no, this thing that we're reading, because our big idea is, is Shakespeare still relevant? This thing that we're reading, no, there's still this line, there's still this connection to these issues of 2022. Um, and so I think, I don't know, I'm in my second year of teaching. Um, and this is the first time I've gotten to teach Othello. Last year we did a snippet of it. And so I, I do struggle with that idea of like, even I have been asked by my admin to give kind of a presentation of what I've learned today um, on this on these general topics. And I'm even struggling with like, what do I name this so I don't get targeted as teaching critical race theory? Like, it's just, it's such a hard, it's so hard to know how to make those discussions mesh in a way that is not going to be seen as me trying to push my agenda, but really genuinely just make the classroom aware of these issues and a safe place for my students who are of color and who are struggling um, and come to me all the time to talk about, you know, this teacher, like they didn't recognize me because I took my braids out, like those types of things. And so it really is, I don't know, I don't have any answers, but just like the fact that this continues to be a problem. Um, and it's, it's really all coming out for me, this unit as I'm going through Othello and we're talking about racism. But how much do I talk about racism? So. Well, I, I admire that you're you're doing that. I know um, institutional breakdowns, right? Particularly of higher ed are still predominantly white, both in terms of faculty and students. And um, so that it, that's, that is very different than a high school scenario. I know that when, I, again, I don't have any answers. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But sometimes I, I, it's the leading question. What does it mean? I'm not offering you any commentary on the race discussion, but maybe you'll have it yourself, right? And sometimes that works and sometimes it's an epic fail, at least for me. I'm not sure if anyone else has experienced that or not. I do like the fellow because I think it, it offers some places where you can maybe talk about things without talking about things. Um, so as a, a former high school teacher, I didn't teach a fellow, I did Macbeth. Um, but sometimes performance history can help because Orson Welles, I think, is the one who did a fellow in blackface. So that's an interesting question, especially because a lot of repertoire companies now are going to blind casting, which means they cast whoever reads for the part the best, um, but they are struggling with that question when it comes especially to Othello and to Aaron in Titus Andronicus because um, of what would be lost in the performance if um, you cast that, that particular role as white. Um, and so there are questions of, of what that means for blind casting. 
And so it's an interesting question that allows for maybe some contemporary discussion without discussion, but I don't, I don't know how your um, administration would look at that. Yeah. Oh, well, I also yeah. should say that. <laughs> we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, thank you all so much. Also, I'm hoping, because this is a conversation that's important that, um, you know, if you feel so, so called, right, that um, we have a sense of, of community through these types of things, um, and support. And so I hope to run into you, if not at future conferences, um, you're always welcome to email me as well. And um, the my, my last name is Jensen, just because it's not on the screen, just in case. But thank you all so much um, for your comments and your participation today. Thank you so much for your presentation. Again, I'm sorry I had to split my time, um, but I hope that you guys can all join us also for the next session with uh, Chris Conquo, and I'll try and gather the two groups back into the main room. <laughs>